Hello, my name is Allison Warner, and I'm the Chief Editor of Orthodontic Products. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of In the Sterilization Room with Jackie, where we talk to infection prevention expert Jackie Dorse about what you need to know to keep the orthodontic team and patients safe during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. For over 20 years, Jackie has been a consultant specializing in instrument sterilization and infection control and prevention in the dental setting. She has degrees in microbiology and dental hygiene, and she has been a featured speaker at the American Dental Association and the American Association of Orthodontists. Jackie, nice to see you again. Hi, Allison. Uh, I hope things have been well at Orthodontic Products during the last week. And yeah. um, uh, I've been busy. Last week, I did mm -hmm. a presentation for the AAO right. um, webinar on respiratory protection. So that's now saved and mm -hmm. available in the AAO online uh, learning library. Yeah available to the membership uh, if they choose to view it. And I, I learned that the AAO with their, um, they now, the way the AAO has now put in a, uh, a member group, if you will, a category mm -hmm. that you can sign up for the doctor and the staff um, that greatly reduces the cost of a lot of their saved webinars. And even many of them are available at no charge. So that's a great benefit for the AAO membership to have that respiratory protection um, mm -hmm. information, how to do the written plan, what mm -hmm. the team needs to know and how to do that fit test and seal yeah. test. Uh, with the higher level mask uh, that we're wearing during this airborne disease transmission right. period. Right. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's a great resource. Well, speaking of airborne transmission, <laughs> um, yes. last week we talked about uh, the CDC's scientific information release on COVID-19, specifically regarding airborne transmission. Um, this week, I know you wanted to dig a little deeper into the information yeah. that the CDC released, specifically we're gonna talk about virus modes of transmission. So where do we start? <laughs> well, I, when the, the information was released, I, I think there was a little confusion within the, the dental and the healthcare community and the public health, because this document was scientific information that CDC released both to the public and to healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So with disease transmission, and this was science, new science, that right. uh, the data and research is uh, providing more information about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which mm -hmm. causes the COVID-19 infection. And it is, CDC referred to it as an airborne disease that can be transmitted by contact, by aerosol, and by airborne. And it gets a little confusing because really the definition is different between what we would expect in our social or public environment mm -hmm. because both aerosol droplets, which are in healthcare considered larger than 50 microns, mm -hmm. and airborne particles, that are less than five microns, so a factor of 10 difference in them, um, were lumped into one category as yeah. airborne respiratory disease transmission. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a virus, and I think it's important for everybody to remember, viruses cannot replicate by themselves. Okay. They, they have to live in, they have to invade a living cell uh, and use that cell's um, replication mechanism, if you will, to reproduce mm -hmm. themselves and to continue to live. Once they exit that living cell, they start to die very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so in the laboratory and on surfaces, bacteria and fungus that cell micro, even though they're microorganisms, they can replicate on their own. As long mm -hmm. as they have nutrient media of some sort, they're good to go. And they can survive on surfaces for that very reason for a lot longer than a virus particle can, because once that virus particle exits the cell that it's used, kills mm -hmm. that cell, then it starts to die very quickly. So mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons that it doesn't survive long-term the way that uh, a bacteria would, uh, or even a spore, if that landed on a surface. So I think there was confusion between what the social definition of airborne was mm -hmm. versus the healthcare definition of airborne. Okay. So knowing this, uh, what should orthodontic practices keep in mind? Well, orthodontic practices, of course, we're in the healthcare community, mm -hmm. and we need to realize that when CDC is addressing recommendations, the guidance for us in our um, orthodontic and dental practices, 
when they when CDC identifies aerosol transmission, then it's the description of those heavy wet droplets that mm -hmm. exit our mouth when we mm -hmm. sing, cough, sneeze, talk loudly, or you know, as I was talking uh, from the podium last week at a live presentation, whenever mm -hmm. we're expelling air, then those heavy wet droplets exit our mouth and they start to fall to surfaces within say three feet. Okay. And then as they travel further, four feet, five feet, even six feet, more of the droplets fall out and those air, heavy wet, 50 micron size or larger, start to lose their moisture. And mm -hmm. that's where the transition from heavy wet aerosol droplets to airborne particles. And those airborne particles, because they don't have the moisture, then they lose a lot of their infectivity, their virility, if you will, they're not as strong. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot more, greater number of the particles to transmit a disease as they travel further away. Okay. So when CDC talk, re, makes recommendations for the uh, dental and the orthodontic practices, and they refer to aerosol generating procedures, mm -hmm. that's when we're using that handpiece. When we're using, um, you know, anything that causes those heavy wet splatters or splashes, so it it was a, a different. I think putting everything under airborne disease transmission and talking a little bit, it sort of confused the issue for many orthodontic practices on this. And I think we need to to remember that the guidance is the same for us. Mm -hmm. um, aerosol generating procedures generated by a high-speed handpiece, um, using our air water syringe, we still need to use extra protection, mm -hmm. an N95 respirator that gives us that seal to prevent any leakage around it, or mm -hmm. a level two or three uh, surgical mask with a shield over it for protection. Uh, and so the guidance that we have now is still adequate for protection with this airborne transmitted disease. So Jackie, this seems really complex. Why did the CDC issue this airborne transmission information at this time? Well, I, th I think part of it was that CDC's had more data come in in the seven months that we've been in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there have been a few situations, unique situations, where it does appear that this virus has been transmitted in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, C CDC has identified like in exercise facilities. Mm -hmm. So imagine a gym, if you will, and it's mm -hmm. a smaller room where maybe they have some of the exercise equipment and there are people out there exercising and they're going real hard at it and they're breathing heavy in and out and they're gonna expel a lot of aerosol particles. Mm -hmm. And if another person, even after that fitness person exited the room, went in, there've been a couple of incidences of where the disease has been transmitted from yeah. someone who was exercising, maybe asymptomatic, tested mm -hmm. positive with a contact tracing that was done afterwards, and that that other next person entering the room acquired the disease. So mm -hmm. an extreme circumstance. Uh, another one is enclosed rooms, spaces that are very well sealed. Uh, they don't have a lot of fresh air coming into them, where they've been people in there that again, didn't have a mask on, but maybe mm -hmm. we're greater than six feet apart, even acquired an infection. Right. And here we are in the winter time in the Northern hemisphere, yeah. uh, coming up on when colder weather is gonna require that doors and windows are closed more. We don't have as much fresh air entering these maybe poorly ventilated spaces, that there is going to be an increased risk of mm -hmm. some, as CDC saying under the social or public recommendation, airborne disease transmission. So it, it doesn't mean that this is an airborne disease transmitted by healthcare definitions such mm -hmm. as mycobacterium tuberculosis, mm. uh, rubiola that causes measles, or uh, varicella that can cause uh, chicken pox. All mm -hmm. three of those diseases have been ad identified scientifically for years as airborne, that they're light floaty particles that are less than five micron size, that they can remain suspended in the air for maybe several hours, six hours or more, measles specifically for at least two hours. So mm -hmm. there is the risk that those few air are transmitted by those light airborne particles. And in, in the hospitals, 
Those are the diseases that have required a negative air pressure room to treat infectious patients, mm -hmm. uh, an AIIR room, an airborne infectious disease isolation room, that is sealed. And after the patient exits that room, uh, care is not provided in that room uh, for two, three hours, whatever it takes for the air exchanges of the HVAC system sure. to clear the air. So much greater precautions in a healthcare facility for those healthcare identified airborne mm -hmm. diseases that again are the small particles. But in general public reference, again, it's taking in those CDC is identifying both the aerosol droplets that are larger that mm -hmm. are expelled. And that's why we're wearing masks uh, still in public and social encounters right. uh, to prevent that disease transmission. But right now, uh, I think CDC is staying and they've reassured the oral health community, the guidance that they've issued is has remained the same for orthodontic practices. Okay. Um, I know I read the, the CDC's uh, information as well, and I know kind of at the end they talk about how this is all part of, you know, the science is continuing to be, you know, evaluated and examined. Um, kind of where is the CDC at this point on where things are? Well, scientific information, both from the laboratory and interpreted from data, requires time. It, it's not something that can happen in a week or two. Yeah. And a CDC specifically at the very end of this release identified five areas that still need further research, such as how effective are the mitigation efforts that we're doing currently. In, in ortho offices, we don't have a record of disease transmission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is uh, what proportion of the infections that have been identified by CDC are acquired by airborne disease transmission. Mm -hmm. And then what are the conditions that facilitate airborne transmission? The next one is what is the infectious dose of the virus? Yeah. Oh, how many viral particles are required to actually acquire an infection? And that's going to be important as we look at these small, dry, floaty particles mm -hmm. uh, that are, uh, you know, in the air and travel further than that six feet. Mm -hmm. And does the inoculum size and the route of inoculation infect the infection risk and the severity of the disease? So a lot more information that we're going to determine from the laboratory and from data gathering with uh, the SARS-CoV. So I think it's important right now for everybody to remember the four key mitigations right. uh, for preventing disease transmission. And number one is to wear the mask, right? Yeah. Number two, hand hygiene, that we always practice the, the good hand hygiene. Number three, if you don't have a mask on, six feet of physical distance mm -hmm. between everyone and number four, uh, have that good air ventilation, the circulation. Don't get in that tightly enclosed room, uh, especially not wearing a mask where there is going to be a greater risk of it. If you do have uh, three, four, five people getting together and they're going to be eating, then do it outside mm -hmm. uh, where you've got greater circulation of the air. So mm -hmm. for the, the following months, as we go through the pandemic, um, and this is going to be our four prevention measures for pre preventing this uh, airborne disease transmission. Yes, definitely good to keep in mind, especially our, as we transition to that colder weather, which is going to keep a lot of people, more people inside. So yes. um, in a continuing service to our audience, um, we are always on the lookout for innovative products to help them get the team through the pandemic. And we thought we'd end on a lighter note. So, and I know you have spotted something quite unique that practice yes. <laughs> consider. I have to give credit to Dr. Marie Fluent, uh, my infection prevention friend in Michigan. Mm -hmm. She recently uh, did a pre uh, presentation for the dental uh, component of the VA uh, in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And when she got ready to speak, she was commenting on how difficult it was to breathe through uh, a procedure or a surgical mask mm -hmm. when you're speaking or talking. Because you know when we're, we're talking from a podium or, or say the treatment coordinator um, when she's doing a, a, tr a presentation to a patient or maybe mm -hmm. even at the front desk when they're on the phone, mm -hmm. uh, we're expelling and inhaling more air and that procedural mask, especially if it's a level one, it'll collapse around your face and you're <gasps> trying to breathe in through it and it gets mm -hmm. hot. Boy, I noticed that when I did my last presentation with a mask on. I'm like, oh, this is really <laughs> warm. 
So Dr. Marie Fluent was introduced to the lipstick protector <laughs> that you can wear behind your mask. Now, <laughs> lipstick sales during the pandemic have gone down about 70 to 80 percent. Because oh, wow. a lot of us are bothering with it. Uh, I mean, nobody sees our lipstick behind yeah. the lipstick behind the mask, but it's not. It, it's used as a, it's called or referred to as a lipstick protector. But what it really does is prevent the mask from collapsing. It looks mm -hmm. like a little tent. It's plastic. It's washable. You mm -hmm. can sanitize it, and it goes underneath your mask, and it gives structure or form to prevent that mask from collapsing. And the big benefit is it makes it cooler. Mm. Wearing all of this hot PPE when you get the gown on and the mask and the set goggles and the shield on over and right. you've got gloves. Oh my gosh, your temp body temperature goes up 10 to 20 degrees, it feels mm -hmm. like. No yeah. one, if you try, if you did a, a thermometer test, we'd all definitely be under 100 degrees <laughs> uh, when we've got all that PPE on. So yeah. having the lipstick protector on actually allows you to breathe more comfortably and is a little bit cooler. And they're available uh, retail online. Uh, Amazon has a number of the lipstick protectors. So I'll be interested in hearing from anyone who invests in it, uh, <laughs> especially those treatment coordinators and even the clinical team. Does right. it help you? Does it help make it more comfortable for you as you uh, navigate through the day uh, wearing all of the PPE required for airborne disease transmission? Yeah, well, I know you've mentioned that you ordered one, so maybe you'll have to uh, model it for us next time. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jackie, for this information. I think this was a good deep dive into what the CDC put out there. And so I think, I mean, I know it's confusing for me, and I'm sure it's confusing for most people. So, yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there's going to continue to be a lot of information that will come out. Some of it's good science, good research. And some of it is questionable. I know mm -hmm. I, I just read this week um, and had it, uh, several different resources sent me uh, links to the information that um, one particular study looked at the SARS virus and said that it could stay, um, uh, that viral particles have been detected on a surface for 28 days. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. As a scientist, I looked at that and I go, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, um, if you look, if you read the article more closely, uh, the scientist identified proteins on a surface, mm -hmm. but are those viral proteins capable of transmitting the disease? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, there's a lot of research that uh, is coming out. Be sure to, to look at the resources and, and interpret how does that apply to me, both in social circumstances and in my orthodontic practice. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Join us next week for the next episode of In the Sterilization Room with Jackie. In the meantime, catch, to catch up on the past episodes or check out the latest orthodontic industry news, visit our website at orthodontproductsonline.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you, Allison, and thank Orthodontic Products. I appreciate the opportunity to share all of this information during the pandemic. Oh, thank you so much, Jackie. Take care. All right.